Good evening. Welcome to Jesus Church Midweek. So glad that you're joining us tonight online or by whatever medium you are with us today. We are rejoicing that you have, uh, that the Lord has made a way for you to be with us. As you know, we are in the study of the book of Romans, and tonight our study takes us to the fourth chapter. We need to make sure we understand the setting of the chapter by remembering that Paul has said that no one is uh, justified in themselves before God. For all have sinned, he says, and fall short of the glory of God. The good news is that we are justified freely by his grace. Now Paul is going to uh, illustrate this historically uh, through uh, the prime example of uh, being justified by faith, which is uh, Abraham. So that takes us now to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to be stopping throughout, making some comments as we walk through verse by verse. Before we do that, I would like to just have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you that it is alive, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide between bone and marrow. Thank you, Lord, that tonight, as we come to you in your word, you've promised to speak to us, to reveal yourself to us, and to open our eyes to your love, your grace, your mercy. Lord, we need that more than ever before. So we ask, Lord, be with us as we walk through these precious, precious promises and illuminate our hearts, we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's an incredible revelation that Paul is connecting the New Testament believers to the man in the Old Testament who is known as the father of faith. He is the one who the Lord said, oh, uh, follow me, uh, go, leave your country, and I will take you to a place uh, that I will show you. And uh, Abraham immediately left that place of his uh, comfort zone and went out. If you would look uh, to the second part of uh, a promise God made to Abraham, is in Genesis uh, chapter 15, uh, beginning at verse 5. And uh, it says, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he, Abraham, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. There's some marvelous truth revealed here. First of all, the Lord has promised that Abraham's descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. A little mathematical wonder. How could that be? As we know, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were barren unable in the flesh, in the natural, to have any children, let alone numerous children. So God is obviously calling Abraham to something that is beyond himself. That is exactly what our life of faith is about. God calls us to live by his promises. God promises that he will save those who believe on him that he will provide, that he will take care of, that he will be with us. So the entire Christian faith is based upon that premise of believing God. And that Paul refers to in chapter 3 as the law of faith. So Paul is basically saying, 
uh, that Abraham was not justified by works, but he was justified by faith. Uh, the accounting that mattered in Abraham's case rested on the principles of grace and faith, not merit and works. So faith has superiority over works. Righteousness was granted. He did not earn it. Grace and faith flowed to Abraham because of his response to a merciful and mighty God. Now we continue reading. At verse 4, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness uh, apart from works. And we read verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. We can actually find these words if you want to turn over to the book of Psalms. And in Psalm 32, we find uh, Paul's quoting this exactly correctly. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2 where we read, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. So, uh, Paul is basically saying that the roots of Christianity go all the way back to that first father of faith, Abraham, making all of us his descendants. As you can imagine, as many as there are stars in the sky, an amazing family of faith. And it goes back to the fact that Abraham believed God, and by believing him, that was accounted to him as righteousness. So we go on now at verse uh, number 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then is it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision so that the people of God, those who were uh, to become the nation of Israel, would be, would be known in the pagan world by a sign in their physical body. The argument uh, from the Jewish perspective was that, well, if you are circumcised, you are righteous with God, and if you are not, then you are not righteous with God. The good news is, is that Abraham was a believer in God before he was circumcised. So God accounted righteousness to Abraham while he was still uncircumcised. This uh, reminds us that God grants righteousness to those who uh, abandon themselves and express personal faith in him. Paul reminds us that circumcision was not based upon uh, law, but upon the righteousness of faith. So Paul extends the fatherhood of Abraham to all who believe. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Perhaps you, like I, have taken some journeys to summer camp in a church van or church bus. And somewhere as we travel together, uh, that little tune... Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. The good news tonight is that if you have placed your faith in the promises of God through his son Jesus Christ, that you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then God's righteousness has been imputed, has been reckoned, has been bestowed upon you. 
there is no way we can measure up to God's righteousness for uh, that he is righteous in every way. And though we may attempt to do, to do good and to think thoughts that would be in line with God's way of thinking, we are by nature sinners, as chapter 2 and 3 reminded us. So Paul is, now that he has set a case that we are all sinners, we all need God's mercy and forgiveness, he now is establishing the, the path or the road to receive that righteousness. And that, of course, is faith. Now, uh, back to Romans 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, Though they were un, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness may be might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision of those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham, whilst uh, had while still uncircumcised. Romans chapter 4 has some complicated English uh, wording. Um, sometimes we read this and we get tongue-tied, and that's uh, sometimes a challenge. Uh, but the point is this, that Abraham was made righteous, bestowed God's righteousness upon him because he believed what God said. So what this means is ethnic background and religious observance are not enough to ensure God's favor. What God is looking for is a walk of faith. Tonight, what a privilege it is to be on that walk of faith. And if you have made Jesus your Lord, if you've received him as your Savior, you are on the journey of faith. And God is committed to develop and shape and bring purpose in your life where sometimes uh, we don't see that very clearly. We read now at verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his, let me read this here, I'm sorry, Let's start again at verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and promise no, made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Again, Paul is reminding us that it is not works, but it is uh, faith that saves us. The, uh, the law came with built-in deficiencies. It's kind of like if you are stuck in a well and screaming out for help, and some good uh, person comes along having a rope in their vehicle and takes that rope and just tosses it into the well. Well, now you have a revelation of how to get out, but the law was not in itself able to get us out of our sin. The law technically reveals sin, Paul says. So we know that we are in a bad situation and that we need rescue, and now the New Testament reveals that the Messiah, Jesus, has come to, uh, to die on the cross, taking our sin and proclaiming our justification. So the law has deficiencies. And uh, Abraham uh, found that he was made a friend of God by faith. Now we read at verse 16. And I want to read this from my Bible because my... My copy here is not the best. 
verse 16, therefore it is of faith that we might be exceeding, up, I'm sorry, therefore it is of faith that we might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Quoting from Genesis so shall your descendants be. As we pause there, we can realize that Abraham did not waver in his belief of, in God's promise. And though God's word was contrary to hope, in other words, you're going to be the father of nations, um, in the physical realm, Abraham would, could have reasoned that could not happen. But the fact is, is that God is a, a worker of miracles. He can do things that are impossible. What is impossible with man is not impossible with God. So verse 16 again says, It was not of works, but it was by faith. This reminds me of a passage in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 8. Here we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is the core of the gospel message. The core is God has done what you could not do for yourself. God has provided the perfect sacrifice for sin, providing not only uh, the, re the removal of our sin, but also the bestowing of his righteousness. I like to think of it as we come here to Good Friday. I like to think of the fact that Jesus died with his arms outstretched. On the one side, forgiveness of sin. All that we had done, our sin, our past, present, and future, our our standing with God was so stained and so marred, but he shed his blood for those sins. On the other side, I like to think of the fact that God was bestowing the righteousness of God through his righteous son. So we have at the cross, we have the removal of sin and the bestowing of righteousness. Righteousness is not something we achieve in ourself. Righteousness is accounted to us because we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Take a minute and give him thanks this holy week. This week as we come up to the celebration of our Lord's resurrection, give him thanks for what he did on the cross. He took your sins. He gave his life. We no longer are stuck in our past. We're no longer uh, in that place of separation. We are now children of God. And according to Genesis, children of Abraham. Let's continue there at verse 19. And being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is a, a marvelous teaching on the subject of faith. 
here we realize that it's not how much faith we have, but where our faith is placed. It's not how much we can do, it's, about, it's all about how much God can do. So it says here, he, uh, if, you, if you look at this, not being weak in faith, uh, in other words, he wasn't taking into consideration his ability or that of his wife. He was looking at God's ability. This is the essence of faith. When we believe that God has already provided, it is, it is uh, the next step to believe in what God has provided. Uh, Jesus actually uh, talked about the law of faith or uh, revealed something about this marvelous truth in the, in the Sermon on the Mount at Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 7 and 8. Uh, Jesus says it this way, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. I, I like to think about the law of faith in this way. God calls me to ask, to seek, and to knock. We're also reminded that in the asking, we are to be confident that those things that we ask, God is able to, um, to give to us. So Jesus is saying, those who ask, those who seek, those who knock shall see, shall, shall find. The door will be opened. Uh, t today, in your own personal life, there may be areas where you just need to ask the Lord, Lord, I, I really need, I really know that you love me and that you have provided for this need. As you ask and knock and seek, the Lord will answer us. Now, the, the truth is that sometimes God answers us in ways that don't align with what we think the answer is. The point is, God is in charge of your development and in your, of your journey. You are not. You and I cannot make, uh, make uh, a decision related to what is best for me. We may think we know the answer to that, but God in His eternal love and in His all-knowing, loving heart knows what's best for you. So when those times come, when you don't understand situations, circumstances, difficulties, you are in good company. You're in the company of the Father of Faith. He could have looked at his situation and said, that's completely impossible. But Abraham simply believed God. It's not that Abraham was perfect, but that his faith is exemplary. He sets an example of what faith is about. So uh, the amazing thing here, uh, as we read, is that uh, he, he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. Um, and verse 21, being fully convinced that what he promised he was able to perform. Sometimes we wrestle with the fact that we don't feel fully convinced. Well, maybe I'm wavering. Maybe I have unbelief. Maybe I have doubts. The good news is, is God's love supersedes your inability to believe. He comes and He takes you where you are. And if you will cast yourself at His feet, if you will simply say, Lord, I seek you in this situation, this circumstance, He will provide the answer. We may not always like God's answer, but we will grow through what He leads us through. Uh, Henry Blackaby, in his uh, book on Abraham, 
uh, reminds us that God brings people of faith through hard lessons. God shapes us, he says, by allowing dire and serious circumstances. They are not serious to God, for he is always in control. How appropriate to grasp that truth tonight in the season we are in, in a time of physical distancing, in a time of um, being uh, sheltered in, in our homes, in a time of separation due to uh, the pandemic that is um, in our world. The good news is, is that God knows how to bring us through difficult times. And He will bring us through this difficult time. He is in control. Blackaby says that in such times, He will teach us four things. One is He will teach us His nature. When we go through problems, we learn more about the nature of God. Like how big He is, how loving He is, how He is in control that his promises are true. He will also teach us our total need of him. That's what problems are for. Problems are to remind us that we need someone bigger to address those problems. Thirdly, he says God will teach us his ways in our life. The Lord wants to walk with us personally and he wants to get us know, to know us uh, we get to know him on a personal level. That means that when you go through t tough times, you learn more about the Lord. We don't seek tough times. We seek the Lord. And as we seek the Lord, he brings us through those tough times. Take encouragement in that tonight. Maybe you need to share that with a, a friend or a fellow uh, in your, your family, someone that you uh, are concerned about, let them know that God is going to see us through. He's never lost a case. His ways are faithful and just. His truth abides. So in the midst of struggle, we learn about his ways. And, and finally, Blackaby points out that in times of struggle, his personal care for, uh, is seen for those our lives affect. Perhaps you are going through a time where your, your difficulty, your struggle, is affecting those around about you. And God uses those difficulties in our life to call us to trust on Him. I uh, was made aware in the life of a family member that um, a friend of theirs was diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. And he was in very serious condition, hospitalized and uh, not given a lot of hope due to um, some other physical uh, ail 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 uh, ailments. He was um, in, a in a bad way. In the midst of that, knowing that this individual loves the Lord and is trusting Him, we could pray a prayer much like this. Lord, see this friend through. Bring him your grace and your healing and establish your plan for him. That was our prayer. I learned just yesterday or the day before that this individual is much improved, that he is no longer on a ventilator, that he is improving and anticipates going home very soon. The concern, of course, was for his immediate family, and they've learned uh, because of some testing that the family is not infected by the virus. Now, I share that not as an example that this will happen to everyone we know, but we do know that God cares for his own. He will see you through. 
no doubt, in whatever situation you may be facing, God is calling you like Abraham to step out, look up, and to believe. Let's finish the chapter where we read now at verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. God's timing is perfect. How appropriate that Romans chapter 4, verse 24 and 25 are in our study as we approach the marvelous celebration of our Lord's resurrection. You see, the answer to sin and our need for righteousness is found in the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus' work on the cross accomplished both the requirement for atonement of sin and the requirement that the sacrifice for sin be completely righteous. And the resurrection is a guarantee that God accepted the payment for sin and has recognized the work of Jesus in conferring righteous status on those who believe in him. Once again, Paul is making this marvelous case that we are needy, we have all sinned, but Jesus has provided the perfect sacrifice. And not only that, he is in every way without sin. He is, as John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As we celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross, we see it in light of that marvelous truth that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Today, because he lives, we can live. Because he is who he is, we can be who God intends us to be. We don't have it in ourselves. Abraham didn't have it in himself. David certainly didn't have it in himself. But the two cases Paul mentions, Abraham and David, both found this marvelous truth that if we have faith, if we believe, God's righteousness is imputed to us. The last word of chapter 4 is again that marvelous word, justification. Jesus was raised because of our justification. Yes, the proof has been pronounced. The case has been settled. Sins have been atoned for. And a righteous life is possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul is going to expound this more as we walk through the following several chapters. But the point is this tonight. I trust you rejoice with me. That the cross was not the end, but the beginning of a life that was made possible by the sacrifice of our Savior. I'd like to pray with you as we uh, close our time. And uh, just remember that salvation is by faith, not works, not ritual, not the law, but it is by faith. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for these words. I pray tonight that you will do a work that you alone can do. I speak peace into the midst of stormy lives. I speak grace where there seems to be only rules and rituals and trying so hard to achieve something. Lord, we speak grace. We speak your peace into the storm. 
Lord, it is our prayer for our world, for our country, that you will alleviate us, alleviate and press back this enemy known as the uh, COVID-19 virus. We ask, Lord, that you return it from whence it came back to the prince of darkness, that, Lord, you are the giver of life. You are the giver of good gifts. So we speak health and peace and grace. And, Lord, as we navigate these days, we thank you that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We thank you that we have the victory in Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, we declare now the grace of God and the peace of God over our soul, over our mind, over our life, over our homes. And Lord, even as we here are celebrating the commemoration of Passover, we think, Lord, how they took the blood of the Lamb and put it above the doorpost and where the blood of the lamb was oh lord you passed over death passed over them lord we are people believers in jesus who are under the blood we ask lord that we might live in the benefits of that marvelous blood sacrifice that we might truly rejoice that he is risen, he is risen indeed. Now we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you richly. Hey, thanks for joining us today. And I pray God spoke to you in a profound way. If you need more resources, please check us out online at jesuschurch.life or you can download the Jesus Church app in the App Store. If you need prayer or would like to give to our ministry through your tithes and offerings, there's a link in the description below where you can do that. Also, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates and events that are coming up at our church. We pray that God would allow you to walk out in the confidence of everything he's called you to do, sharing the gospel and showing the good news of everything that Jesus has for you. God bless and have a great day.